thanks very much. Um, today I'm uh, talking on distal biceps tendon ruptures, um, uh, summarising an article in, uh, in JBJS um, in 2010. Um, basically the treatment of distal t uh, biceps tendon ruptures uh, still remains controversial. Operative fixation is recommended in the majority of cases uh, uh, currently, uh, but the optimal surgical approach and fixation uh, technique remains a topic of the ideal treatment uh, involved minimal morbidity during the approach, optimal strength of fixation while minimising the complications. Uh, it's a bit of background, the epidemiology. Uh, it's a relatively rare injury, an incidence of 1.2 per 100,000 patients per year. It usually involves the dominant extremity, which in one, uh, one epidemiological study involved 86% 86, 86 of the injuries involved the dominant extremity and 93% of affected patients are male. Uh, age range is 30 to 60 with an average age of 47 and smokers have a 7.5 uh, risk of distal biceps tendon rupture. Uh, the pathogenesis is not well understood and there's a couple of uh, proposed mechanisms that contribute to uh, biceps tendon ruptures. Uh, one cadaveric study by Zeela et al looked at 27 cadavers and one theory that they uh, proposed was uh, in the central portion of the distal biceps tendon, there was a 2.14 centimetre diameter uh, hypovascular zone in the tendon that um, corresponded to uh, seen on microscopy uh, that would uh, the blood supply of the uh, biceps tendon uh, in the proximal uh, segment uh, supplied by branches. on the diagram and uh, zone 3 is supplied by the posterior radial recurrent artery and in zone 2 there's a relative area of hypo fusion. In addition another uh, another mechanism uh, contributing that the, this paper proposed was uh, mechanical impingement. In uh, full supination the uh, radio ulnar distance at the, late, at the level of the radial tuberosity uh, is quite wide uh, and in full pronation reduces by 48% hence impinging uh, Just running through the anatomy briefly, the two heads of biceps long and short, origin of the long head is the supraglenoid tubercle, the short head coracle and they both merge at the level of the deltoid tuberosity Insertion of the distal biceps is uh, the bicipital the radial tuberosity and the bicipital aponeurosis, which is to the fascia over the forearm flexor. Innervated by the musculocutaneous nerve, usually a single branch, um, but the, you can get a second branch uh, just below some people. That's the diagram of the uh, normal anatomy. So, usually two. Two bands of the distal biceps uh, tendon, uh, as well as the bicep, inserting them to the um, the radio. Uh, so recent anatomical studies have identified two separate tendon fibers uh, on the distal tendon, uh, anteromedial fibers, which largely originate from the short head uh, and attachment cubicle and posterolateral fibers superiorly on the tubercle. Um, and they found in um, in cadaver studies that anteromedial fibers that original originate from the short head during pronation and supination they stay fairly static while the posterolateral fibers loop around the back and um, rotate. Second, and the anteromedial fibers, as you can see of the diagram, will stay static and the posterior lateral fibers will rotate. Um, the short head contribution, so the anteromedial fibers um, insert more distally on the radius and therefore there's a longer lever arm, and so that therefore the short head contributes more to um, strength. Um, this, um, the short head is a biomechanically stronger flexor. 
uh, the distal of the distal portion of the long head inserts further from the central axis, so therefore the long head seems to be the more. Uh, the bicipital aponeurosis originates at the musculotendinous junction and appears to act uh, just as a stabiliser rather than contributing to on the distal biceps tendon medially as the forearm flexes contract, so that function can possibly contribute to ruptures at that level. The authors recommended that native anatomy or suggested should be recreated when performing the repair as much Going back to clinical evaluation, so usually the mechanism of a distal biceps tendon rupture is an unexpected forced extension injury uh, to a flexed elbow and um, the force is followed by an eccentric contraction of the biceps a tearing sensation felt by the patient in the cubital fossa. Symptoms of acute pain, then followed by chronic pain, with marked supination weakness being So clinical signs that may be seen, loss of normal biceps contour, and obvious deformity may be present um, in some patients, and uh, flexion and supination weakness uh, on clinical examination. There's two special tests that the authors mentioned in this study that have been described, the biceps squeeze test and the hook test, which I'll describe in uh, the next slide. And uh, delayed diagnosis clinically uh, may preclude a primary repair or lead to diagnosis that's not picked up. Bicep squeeze test uh, described in one paper um, is um, performed by uh, having the patient seated, the elbow at 60 to 80 degrees of flexion, slight pronation. An examiner stands on the ipsilateral side and squeezes the biceps firmly, one hand at the distal muscular tendinous junction and the other at the muscle belly. And then if the, the forearm isn't observed to supinate, then it's a negative test indicating a biceps tendon or muscle belly rupture. Uh, this is described by Rule and Dow, and they reported 96% positive tests uh, and uh, with patients that had a rupture confirmed. So they reported 100% of patients who had To be honest, I tried this. I hadn't seen this before. I tried it on a couple of people. I couldn't get it. I couldn't. I'm a bit um, sceptical about this paper. <laughs> um, something that does seem more reliable is the hook test. So with an elbow flexed to 90 degrees, um, hooking the finger under the lateral uh, edge of the biceps tendon, uh, and that does seem to be normal and and uh, in a normal individual and uh, in a distal biceps. negative because you can, it's quite palpable. Um, again, they reported 100% sensitive in specificity in the paper that described it. Um, however, it's just, yeah, 100% sensitive in specificity is a big claim uh, to make. Uh, imaging plain x-ray, uh, you can get enlargement in, and irregularity around the radial tuberosity uh, or even a frank convulsion of the radial tuberosity. MRI is useful to delineate integrity and intrasubstance degenerative change in the tendon. MRI is reported to have a sensitivity of 92% and a specificity of 85% for complete And um, a protocol has been described for uh, optimum imaging of the distal biceps tendon. Degrees of abduction and a uh, supernatural visualise the full length on a couple of MRI imaging showing the distal biceps tendon Moving along to treatment, so uh, in the 1940s uh, their um, operative treatment was uh, seemed to be the norm saying that it was impractical and unwise to try to distal biceps ruptures because, um, because of the intraoperative and um, 
However, in 1985, uh, there was a, a severe result with operative fixation, which reported better supination and flexion strength and better endurance. This is backed up by a few more recent papers, uh, which uh, by Chalimi et al. 2007, although they're all small papers, and better European Society for Surgery of the Shoulder and Elbows group and Hedstroni et al. Uh, the biggest study that um, uh, probably moved things towards operative management was um, by Freeman, who looked at non-operative management and found that um, the supination strength uh, with non-operative management uh, was on average 63% lateral arm. Although flexion strength seemed fairly well preserved with conservative percent of the contralateral arm. They compared this to historical controls, which were uh, repeated surgically, and um, average supination strength for the historical controls, so which, um, which swayed the um, So now non-operative treatment seems it's usually only for sedentary patients who don't require elbows or supination strength, the patient's not fit to surgery. Um, in the past, so there's two methods of repairing, either anatomic or non-anatomic repair. So anatomic repair consists of repairing the distal biceps back to the radial tuberosity directly, or the biceps tendon can be uh, tina deist uh, and uh, reattached to the brachialis, which doesn't involve as extensive uh, dissection. Uh, the non-anatomic repair can improve the flexion strength, although it's been criticised that it may not improve the supination strength uh, because it only... Uh, so therefore... There's very little supination gain from that. Um, but however, in delayed uh, chronic ruptures, it may be uh, the only option. So there's a few papers that have compared uh, uh, that are uh, Meheran and Kilgore from 1960 found a higher dis uh, disability in uh, a non-operative group. They compared non-operative anatomic fixation and non-anatomic fixation Similar outcomes in anatomic and non anatomic. In 1999, Rentana and Arava, however, uh, found that anatomic repair was associated with 90% good, excellent results, and non anatomic repair only had 60% good or excellent results. Uh, and this was a meta-analysis of about 147 uh, distal biceps ruptures. So in, in, on the strength of uh, mostly that paper, uh, you could, you could uh, come to the conclusion that anatomic repair is superior in outcomes to... Um, another study as well uh, by Klons et al. and Kerry uh, performed isometric muscle strength study, only 14 patients. Supination strength on average was only 76% of the contralateral arm in the non group. Uh, and in fact, as a, looking at only eight patients, four patients had no improvement in supination strength after a non Another, uh, so there's two uh, main operative techniques uh, for repairing distal biceps ruptures, a one incision or a two incision approach. But originally a one incision approach was described by Dobby and uh, Mecker and Kilgore, uh, utilising a Henry approach to proximal forearm. Um, the advantage of this approach is a direct approach. You avoid the posterior interosseous nerve. Uh, however, there's a whole lot of other nerves and uh, that can be damaged, as well as the risk of HO and complex regional pain syndrome. 
So the approach for the one incision repair, so the proximal uh, extent of the Henry's approach, starting from the distal biceps tendon fascia of the uh, and uh, finding uh, the plane between uh, brachioradialis, um, FCR, and pronator teres, lateral uh, cutaneous nerve of the forearm, right in the field, it can be is, which I'll go into in a later slide. Uh, so it's good to identify and protect lateral cutaneous nerve, and very muscular cutaneous nerve may be used. Uh, on deeper uh, exposure, uh, there's um, the radial nerve, the superficial branch, uh, and the current radial artery usually runs over the distal. As far as operative technique uh, goes, the tendon ends usually identified as elevated from the wound and debrided. Uh, and then the radial tuberosity is usually identified through the space left by the biceps tendon. The exposure is not usually as extensive as... as uh, ...illustrate the, uh, the proximity of the nerves and why neopraxias um, and uh, paresthesias can be quite... Um, there's several techniques for reattaching the tendon. So currently there's um, techniques such as bone, uh, anchors, bone tunnels, interference screws, and cortical fixation uh, buttons. Uh, the tendons usually uh, reattach to the ulnar aspect of the tuberosity, so to give you the maximum uh, lever um, for supination. Which is the saline lavage to the tendon to try and prevent um, So tips to avoid nerve injury, try and keep the, with this approach, to keep the forearm in full supination to keep the posterior interosseous nerve um, and the anterior interosseous nerve away from the operative area. The most common cause of nerve injury is compression around retraction, around the levering uh, on either side uh, that can damage Limiting the forceful retraction of the brachioradial limits the potential for uh, posture. Um, so the one incision repairs, there's a lot of complications that have been described, nerve injuries, complex regional pain syndromes, um, which can lead to radio ulnar synostosis lead to range of So because of all the description, all this uh, two incision technique described, uh, which seem to reduce these to a certain extent. Described by Boyd and Anderson in 1961, and involves using, using just a limited anterior approach to avoid the posterolateral incision, which Boyd described, but has been modified. to perform the fixation of the tendon on the radial. Modified by Paler in 1990 uh, to go through the common extensor muscles rather than going by. So the advantage are that the limits the anterior dissection, limits pain, uh, reduces likelihood of injury to various nerves, including the radial nerve rupture. And um, prior, to, in, in, prior to the um, advent of modern anchor, Uh, disadvantages are uh, that um, the way that Boyd described it involved dissecting the supernator away from the ulna, which and there's a higher chance of um, HO and formation. The so two incision repair that Boyd and Anderson described curvilinear incision over, cubital, over the cubital fossa. And these are diagrams from Boyd and Anderson's original paper. Um, the deep fascias in size and the biceps tendon located um, suture with both ends emerging from the tendon tip and then passing the uh, 
distal tendon through the canal um, with blunt uh, and making a postural lateral incision and approach through ECU and caneus, um, supinator strip from the proximal ulna to doing this in full pronation to try and prevent the then with a um, they described a making a window uh, and then drilling two holes in the other side of the radial tuberosity and then passing the the biceps tendon, uh, passing the sutures through the two drill holes, pulling the tendon into that window. And then, um, so two incision repairs, there's a few case series that, that look at the um, two incision repairs. In 1985, Bacon Beerwagen said that um, they found that Supination strength and endurance were restored. No unsatisfactory results in their series of 10. Uh, another series of 10 by D'Alessandro uh, looked at um, the repair fleets and found that um, the satisfaction was 9.75 out of 10, uh, so very good. Uh, and they found only minor losses in, um, in endurance and um, supination strength, depending on whether the Uh, Davison had a case, case series of uh, eight, again found uh, six out of eight good or excellent satisfaction. I did find that five out of eight had decreased. In 1999, uh, Kurunaka, um, they found that um, they had slightly uh, worse results in their case series. Uh, they found a decreased range of movement in, of movement in about... Um, and uh, decreased supination strength in almost half, 33%, uh, most of which was um, HO. However, despite all the complications described, uh, they described good or excellent outcome. There's been many complications described of the two incision repair also. So posterior enterosis nerve palsies, posterior uh, postoperative uh, median nerve entrapment. Um, Kelly uh, in 2000 described a lot of complications, a uh, complication rate of 31%, persistent anterior elbow pain, sensitive nerve paresthesias, HO, decreased range of movement. Um, and they found the complication rate was high with chronic tears. Um, Chavan et al. Uh, looked at a systematic review of two incision repairs and found a complication rate of 16%, again with the most common uh, loss of forearm rotation or uh, rotation. Interesting, uh, interestingly enough, they didn't um, consider HO as a complication unless you lost more than 30 degrees of movement. Uh, a case series of um, one incision repairs, I won't go through everyone in. Uh, in detail, but basically the same complications were uh, were uh, described. Uh, similar complications in one incision repairs. Uh, these are more um, one incision repairs have been now become more popular because of more more modern fixation techniques where you can get good fix through the one uh, anterior incision, um, being suture anchors and cortical um, cortical. So in these case histories, the most, again, the most, most had uh, good outcomes, um, and uh, low, fairly low complication rates. Um, again, the most common being loss of um, loss of range of movement. Only four case histories with cortical. Uh, there's only two papers that directly compared two incision versus one incision repairs. 
uh, one from 2003, which was a prospective cohort study uh, of 19 uh, patients. Uh, they compared nine uh, single incision to 10 two incision repairs, and uh, one group, uh, one, year, one year, one incision, uh, one incision group had 11 marginally. no um, difference in the supination range or strength or elbow flexion strength, but they found a higher complication rate in the one in three nerve palsies and one symptomatic incision group had only one transient supination. Uh, a meta-analysis looked at, um, this is probably the strongest paper comparing two techniques, uh, which involved repairs only with at least one year follow-up. They found that there was a 94% satisfaction outcome um, to incision technique and only a 69 satisfactory outcome in the one incision technique. So the set, they defined a satisfactory outcome as no more than 30 degrees loss in any plane and no, um, or greater than 80% strength side and no major complications. The majority of the unsatisfactory outcomes were due to loss of forearm. Quite a large discrepancy between satisfaction. This um, has. So we'll, despite this, the. This weighs uh, people in favour of the two decisions. Um, although yeah, it remains, um, um, the ideal method of fixation is also controversial. So the main options are transosseous sutures, um, perhaps not so often uh, done currently. Uh, bone tunnels, as as described by Boyd and Anderson, uh, suture anchors, uh, interference screws, or um, cortical buttons. There hasn't been any clinical studies to to find out which um, is superior. But there's been several cadaveric biomechanical studies um, that show on the balance of cortical button fixation seems to have the highest fixation strength. So this is a quick rundown. So there's um, um, eight of them, and um, the, third, the oldest ones found no difference between bone tunnels and suture anchors. The green ones I've highlighted, highlighted as being the stiffness. So in 2002, there was one study that found bone anchors were better than suture anchors. And in 2004, 2006, suture anchors and interference screws uh, were found to be superior. However, the more recent studies um, after cortical button strength uh, and stiffness. Um, Post-op rehab, so with, with, a, with better fixation methods, um, rehab protocols have seemed to become more uh, aggressive uh, and allowed uh, more so the, the authors of this current review have suggested that, um, that their protocol they said between one to six weeks but then they um, specified exactly exactly when they start six weeks seems like it's late month assisted range of movement exercises, uh, gradually initiated and progressed and aimed for full extension by six weeks and then strengthening up this. No, well they, that's exactly, they, they've said to, to start somewhere between six weeks to start mobilising from one week at the earliest. They haven't. Well, they've said. Well, they've said start mobilising one week at the earliest, and aim to get full extension by six weeks. No, mobilise for one to six weeks. Oh, oh. But they haven't oh, specified okay. why they choose oh, when well, they choose one and when six years, weeks. Right. But they've said they'll start mobilising in from one, from one to six weeks, and they haven't. Right. Um and. Yeah, well, they haven't. Oh, they haven't really gone into. They just basically they haven't. They've just said that the 
But post-operative rehab seems to be getting more aggressive with the better fixation techniques, and this seems appropriate. And our protocol is we even start getting people moving at one week in some some repairs and try to get them back to full strength in five, six weeks. Um, another suggested protocol in 2005, uh, 2005 um, also had a, a protocol that um, they used a, a hinged elbow brace uh, and they um, from immediately after repair and then graduate extension. Uh, they locked it at 60, uh, so the um, mm -hmm. move from 60 to full flexion immediately and then graduate extension by 20. Strengthening after eight weeks, and they had fairly, uh, they had good results. Lots of movement, normal movements, flexion extension, good uh, strength and flexion and supination. Uh, Henselman and Al again, they um, had a split for three to five days only. And then a compression sleeve, and then gentle active range of movement starting from a week, a week's time. Um, their fixation technique was dual fixation uh, with a cortical button and an interference screw. Um, and then they even started strengthening with a one-pound weight at the week mark as well. Definitely um, returning to uh, activities of daily living after two to three weeks is tolerated, um, but no excessive uh, resistance exercises for two to three. So to summarise, um, distal bicep tendon rupture is usually presented as a sudden pain and tearing after a large extension force applied to a flex elbow. Typically there's pain and deformity, supination weakness um, as the cardinal sign. MRI can be helpful in delineating the injury and evaluating the quality of the tendon. Uh, there's two incision and single incision repair techniques uh, have different outcome complications. Surgeon preference. Um, after single incision techniques, there's maybe slightly higher uh, prevalence of nerve injuries, but more HO after a two incision technique. Uh, so one method of fixation over another, but um, cortical buttons, um, hybrid techniques incorporating cortical, uh, cortical buttons seem to have the highest uh, biomechanical strength. In uh, stronger fixation techniques. Uh, may allow for more aggressive rehab protocols, uh, but more uh, large comparative studies are